Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We're in a very interesting and provocative series entitled Revival and Reformation. This is a series for the months of July, August, and September of 2013. If you've been enjoying our times together here on this program, you might want to look at our website. It's found at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, and there you will find a variety of materials related to these lessons. We have some exciting news coming up, which we'll tell you about later, but for right now, you can go, you can look at uh, the, the, the handwritten materials that, that we use here. Maybe you'd like to use them in your own Sabbath school class. <coughs> this particular lesson is lesson number three for July 20 of 2013. It's entitled, The Word, The Foundation of Revival. The Word. We'll get into the Word in a moment, but we hope you've got one in your hand. Grab your Bible if you don't have it already, and let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we come to you with humble hearts, recognizing that if it were not for your Word, your Son, the Living Word, and the Written Word, we would be totally lost. We wouldn't have a clue where to go or what to do. So we are in eternally indebted to you for this inspired record. Help us to understand it better. Help us to understand why it's not like any other literature that is, is truly inspired and inspiring. May we come to know you better because of our time together today as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in this lesson, we will learn about the role of the Bible its role in the Christian life, and maybe we ought to focus particularly about the implications for the Bible and the importance of the Bible in the final events of this Earth's history. What's the relationship between faith and the Bible? And what's God's relationship to the Bible? Uh, a few words, very quickly, from the founder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Ellen White. This is from Review and Herald, December 15, 1885. The Bible and the Bible alone is to be our creed. That's pretty blunt and pretty straightforward. Every chapter and every verse of the Bible is a communication from God to men. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 504. Make the Bible its own expositor, bringing together all that is said concerning a given subject at different times and under various circumstances. Review and Herald, October 9, 1883. The Bible is its own expositor. Scripture is to be compared with Scripture. The student should learn to view the, world as, the Word as a whole and to see the relation of its parts. He should gain a knowledge of its grand central theme, of God's original purpose for the world, of the rise of the great controversy, and of the work of redemption. By the way, uh, you who are here, what's the grand central theme of the Bible? The gospel. Jesus. The gospel. God. God. Love. And his conflict with the devil. The great controversy certainly would be right up there. He should see how this controversy enters into every phase of human existence. I'm going on reading here. How in every act of life he himself reveals the one or the other of the two antagonistic motives. And how, whether he will or not, he is even now decided upon which side of the controversy he will be found. Education, page 190, paragraph 2. There's another paragraph oh. that I'd like to add to that. Okay. <clears throat> It talks about this great central theme. Mm -hmm. And how is that central theme brought to us? How do we, how do we come to that? Mm -hmm. There is one great central truth to be kept ever before the mind in the searching of the scriptures, Christ and him crucified. Every other truth is invested with influence and power corresponding to its relation to this theme. Mm -hmm. So as we are looking and at the, you, yeah. uh, that's uh, manuscript 31, 1890. Okay, is it and it's found in 7 ABC 458.1. Okay. But in, in the idea of 
this great controversy between Christ and Satan, mm -hmm. as we look at Christ, we begin to appreciate what mm -hmm. that controversy is all about. Yeah. David talks a lot about the Word and about God's guidance in his life. Um, look at a few passages. What do you think was going on here? Look at Psalm 119, for example. There's a number of passages in this, in this one long, the longest chapter in the Bible. Look at verse 50. Even in my suffering, I was comforted because your promise gave me life. And then drop down, look at verse 74. Those who honor you will be glad when they see me because I trust in your promise. That sounds good. Look at verse 116. Give me strength as you promised and I shall live. Don't let me be disappointed in my hope. And then finally, verse 154. Defend my cause and set me free. Save me as you have promised. So he, 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 had, he felt like he had a very close relationship with God. Uh, in fact, he was very close as suggested by 2 Samuel 2, verses 1 through 4. Look at that, 2 Samuel 2. After this, David asked the Lord. Now, this, Saul has just died, Jonathan has just died, and David is now, he's, he's, he's thinking, you know, I know I was anointed. God, do you want me to rush up to Jerusalem? Or where do I go? What do you want me to do? So after this, David asked the Lord, shall I go and take control of one of the towns of Judah? Yes, the Lord answered. Which one? David asked. Hebrew, and the Lord said. I mean, this is not like he's having a conversation with God. So David went to Hebron, taking with him his two wives, Ahinoam, who was from Jezreel, and Abigail, Nabal's widow, who was from Carmel. He also took his men and their families, and they said, you know, all you people who have two wives, you can talk to the Lord like that. <laughs> right? I have hard enough with time with one. <laughs> no, just a minute. Be careful here. Careful. Well, David found... Get hoof and mouth disease pretty yeah. quick here. <laughs> we may have a heart attack. <laughs> Well, is there real life to be found in the Bible? Hmm. What are we, what, again, what are we talking about when we talk about revival? Oh, it must have something to getting out of the Laodicean condition. Wow. <laughs> Why is the Bible different than any other type of literature? It's inspired. What does that mean? It means it has been God-directed. Okay. Can you tell it when you read something of it's really inspired? Well, it doesn't or tell does it a little some... special signal there that says this one is and this one isn't. Okay. But it says all scripture is given. And I don't want to get into a long discussion of this, but we as Seventh-day Adventists look at the writings of Ellen White as special. Would you call them inspired? <clears throat> Yeah. We believe that God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost Spirit created our universe, right? Mm -hmm. Shouldn't they be able to recreate us? What is the Holy Spirit's main contribution to spirit, Christian life? Wasn't it the Holy Spirit who inspired the prophets of the Old Testament and the, and the apostles of the New Testament to write our Bible? Well, Ellen White said these words. The creative energy that called the worlds into existence is in the Word of God. This Word imparts power. It begets life. Every command is a promise accepted by the will, received into the soul. It brings with it the life of the Infinite One. Every word accepted, brought into the soul, brings with it what? The life of of the infinite one. It transforms the nature and recreates the soul in the image of God. Ellen White, Education, page 126. You'd think you'd want to spend an awful lot of time in that process. Wow, I, would, I should think so. I mean, what would happen if a group of Seventh-day Adventists really did that? They might finish the work. Oh dear. <laughs> what would we do then? <laughs> Go to heaven, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's very easy to read the Bible casually and we see almost no benefit. We, we can enjoy the interesting and, and inspiring stories and think about 
you know, David and what he did, and we can think about Samson, and our kids love those kinds of stories. We can, it's, it's, it's interesting to read about the marvelous miracles that Jesus did, and he had a lot of interesting stories in his life. But do we think, well, well, are we thankful for what we learn about God from each of those stories? What, what is God challenging us to do when he says, read the Bible, study the Bible? What's he asking us to do? To learn about him. To learn about him. Mm -hmm. When you get a letter from somebody you haven't seen in a long time, you say, well, I'll read a paragraph today, and maybe I'll read another paragraph tomorrow, and another one the day after that. You want to read the whole thing, and you want to read it again later, and read it again later. And why do you do that? It makes you feel close with them. You You're interested in anything. them. You, and you want, you, you want to feel close to that person. You want to get to know more about that person, right? Yeah, you want to know what's happening to them. Uh, could we do that uh, with God? Yes. Do we really want to be a friend of God? Yes. Yes. How often, when we read the Bible, do we say, okay, God, help me to think like you? And how often do we say, well, God, I, maybe not out loud, but we say, well, I've got these ideas, God. Let me see if I can find something here in the Bible that supports my ideas. None of us would do that, right? Well, yeah, you do. You, you read something in the scripture and you says, my, that's an interesting point. And then you say, I wonder if there's any other place in scripture that says that same thing, that, that says that same idea. So you, there are times when you go looking through scriptures for a particular idea. Mm -hmm. And do we tend to like the parts that we, do we tend to read the parts we like and sort of skip over the parts we don't like so well? Yeah, I'm afraid so. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, well, I think the parts that, that we, we're not smart enough and we're not spiritual enough to really pick up an awful lot of what we should be picking up, not just because we don't like it. Yeah. Romans 8 tells us that all three members of the Godhead want to be on our side. All three members of the Godhead want to be on our side. They're doing everything they can to be on our side. Wouldn't it be a dr terrible mistake not to join the team? I mean, when you had a group like that rooting for you, how can you lose? Good. I don't know, how come so many of us lose then? Yeah. Because we're trying to be captain of the team. I think you're right. Yeah. Well, how many of us have had Emmaus Road experiences? You remember the story, it's found in Luke 24, 13 to 35. I don't have time to read the whole thing, but you remember there were those two, not the 12 of the 12 disciples, but two lesser known disciples who on Sunday afternoon of crucifixion weekend, they're walking away from Jerusalem about seven miles. And suddenly there's someone walking along with them and he says, and I, I have to read my favorite part of this story. Uh, Jesus says, he, he walks up alongside them. He said to them, what are you talking about to each other as you walk along? Jesus talking, okay? They stood still with sad faces. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have been happening there these last few days? And what would you expect God to say? What things? <laughs> <laughs> I just love that part. God has a fantastic sense of humor. The things that happened to Jesus of Nazareth, they answered. This man was a prophet who was considered by God and by all the people to be powerful in everything he said and did and so forth and so forth. Our priests, priests, priests and rulers uh, took him out and they crucified him and so forth. Ellen White has some very interesting comments about that story. Not only was it amazing that Jesus took those disciples through and gave them a Bible study, but look what he did and how he did it. And, and this uh, is found in, in um, Spirit of Prophecy. That's a, the small facsimile series that are available. Uh, volume 3, page 214. 
This is the, the predecessors to the Great Controversy series. Jesus did not first reveal himself in his true character to them and then open the scriptures to their minds. For he knew, and you could imagine this, I mean, just think what would happen. For he knew that they would be so overjoyed to see him again, risen from the dead, that their souls would be satisfied. They would not hunger for the sacred truths which he wished to indelibly impress upon their minds, that they might impart them to others, who should in their turn spread the precious knowledge until thousands of people should receive the light given that day to the despairing disciples as they journeyed to Emmaus. What was the purpose of Jesus talking to them? To make missionaries out of them. And out of who else? All. Everyone. All of us. Yeah. This message is supposed to be all for all of us. Now, how did he do it? Jesus maintained his disguise till he had interpreted the scriptures and had led them to an intelligent faith in his life, his character, his mission to earth, and his death and resurrection. He wants them to understand. Now, what scriptures is he referring to? Probably some of those things in Isaiah that uh, we call well, messianic. Okay. So, and what you're mentioning, the point is, this is in the Old Testament. This is not New Testament. There's no New Testament written yet. Right. This is the Old Testament. He wants them to see all the details of his life spelled out in the Old Testament. He wished the truth to take firm root in their minds, not because it was supported by his personal testimony, but because the typical law and the prophets of the Old Testament, agreeing with the facts of his life and death, presented un questionable evidence of that truth. When the object of his labors with the two disciples was gained, he revealed himself to them that their joy might be full and then vanished from their sight. Well, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 3, 214, Paragraph 1 and 2. What does that teach us? It kind of supports the paragraph that I read earlier. Mm -hmm. Because he taught them all the things about himself. Mm -hmm. his, in his death, his sure. resurrection. Yeah. And... Okay. Hope so. Yeah, just a bulb doing its thing, I guess. Maybe it's going out. But the point here we want to say is, faith is based on evidence. Yes. On the day of his resurrection, and with all of heaven waiting to rejoice over his victory in the great controversy, all the universe is waiting to rejoice over his victory in the great controversy, Jesus took that much time to teach those two disciples, and the rest of us listening in, because now we are, how to read and understand the Bible. Imagine God himself disguising himself so that we would not believe his words just because of who he is. God wants us to believe him because we have proven that his words are true, not just because he is God. Wow! What, what does that mean in, in real practical experience? He doesn't want us to believe it because he said it. He, from the voice of authority, he wants to pull together things that we've studied mm -hmm. through Scripture for years and years, through the whole Bible that he's said from all time. Could we say that, that he wanted to develop a line of evidence mm -hmm. as opposed to a claim? Yes. Good way. Well, and he wants us to confirm the facts of what he tells us. He wants, to, he wants us to see that he doesn't say it just as a claim or as a statement. He says it because it's true. And he wants us to confirm it, to test it, to test it, to test it. Not to doubt it, but to say, we have solid evidence that this is a fact. Yeah. Remember, the time is coming when what's going to happen? Someone claiming to be God will make all kinds of false statements and claims. And how can we prepare ourselves for that time when the devil will appear in person? Study. No. We better know the Bible like the back of our hand. Great feelings are often thought to be an evidence of revival. 
But unfortunately, feelings are largely a result of external forces. Now, listen to what I'm going to say real closely, because I want you, maybe you won't agree with this. And the devil knows how to manipulate every kind of external force you can imagine. In fact, right now, the devil is preparing an entire generation to think that at all costs they must avoid any unpleasant feelings. Look at the music industry in the United States, the movie industry. Look at the pharmaceutical industry. It's all about feeling good. With so many people depending, up, uh, depending upon external influences to control their feelings and their lives, when the devil is able to control these external influences, would it be correct to say that those people will be demon-possessed? Certainly. But is it that's influenced, if yeah. not outright possession. But is it not true that our feelings follow our thoughts? That's what's supposed to happen. Well, it happens. No matter what your feeling is, it is coming after your thought process. But there are many ways in which you don't really have to think. The devil is getting, becoming more and more clever. I mean, I give medicines to people every day because they beg, they demand them, that basically separate reality from, from their thought processes because they don't want to feel pain, they don't want to have any unpleasant feelings, they don't want depression, they don't want... But if we're having feelings of anger, if we're having feelings of depression, is it not because we have allowed our thought process to dwell on that? Yeah. And if we want our feelings to be joyful, mm -hmm. then we have to have our thought processes on joyful things mm -hmm. and the life, death, resurrection, and what Jesus stands for is one of the best. Yeah. Luke 18, 8, Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Wow. Well, what is the relationship between faith and feeling? And how would you define faith? Many of us have a, a good friend who's unfortunately passed on now, but uh, A. Graham Maxwell, he used to define faith in this way. Faith is just a word we use to describe a relationship with God. Notice that. Faith is just a word we use to define a relationship with God as with a person well known. The better we know him, the better the relationship may be. We can't say will be because who knew him very well? Lucifer. 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 And he became Satan because he chose to rebel. Well, faith implies an attitude toward God of love, trust, and deepest admiration. In, in, uh, deepest admiration. It means having enough confidence in God based on the more than adequate evidence revealed to be willing to believe what he says as soon as we're sure he's the one saying it, to accept what he offers as soon as we're sure he is the one offering it, and to do what he wishes as soon as we're sure he is the one wishing it without reservation for the rest of eternity. Anyone who has such faith would be perfectly safe to save. That is why faith is the only requirement for heaven. Faith also means, and here's where many people would depart from us, faith also means that like Abraham and Moses, we know God well enough to reverently ask him why. I would ask the question, in that definition, it means having enough confidence in God and having be willing, da 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 da, da. How is that developed? How, does, how is that condition or that set of conditions described here developed? Bible study. Over time. Prayer. I would suggest that it's that paragraph that I read earlier. Mm -hmm. of focusing on Jesus Christ, yeah. Him crucified and risen, that can give us this, uh, some, a condition that will fit this description. And, but I would go beyond that. I would say we need to find God from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. We need to find God in every single passage of Scripture that we read. I agree. Yeah. If I may add one thing, yeah. we not only need to find him, but we have to keep on finding him. Yeah. 
because that's what we, the notion of revival is to we live to be born again, but it's on a continuum daily and daily and daily and daily. Yeah. Last week, Ken, um, I, I just happened to have the notes here. Um, one of the things that we mentioned was a statement from Ellen White, the Ministry of Healing, that says prayer and faith mm -hmm. will do uh, what no power on earth can accomplish. Mm -hmm. So this relationship you're talking about with this with the faith uh, we put that together with prayer that is what is going to accomplish mm -hmm. what no power on earth can accomplish uh, yeah. i think another way of saying that is to say that this process allows humanity to be connected with divinity and jesus was this express condition the express example of what that union can accomplish I'm going to, um, gonna, I, I, I'm, I'm challenging, and I hope, I hope you won't think I'm going beyond my, my role here, but if you read Exodus 23, God told the children of Israel he would take them into the land of Canaan, he would chase out all the occupants with hornets or whatever, some kind of natural forces, and he would give them the land. If you go over to Deuteronomy 20, when they're actually ready to enter the land. He says, no, you're going to have to do that. You're going to have to fight your way into the land. I'll help you, but you're going to have to do it yourself. You're going to kill everyone there, leave alive, not alive nothing that breathes. What changed? They wouldn't do it his way, so... Why? I suppose it was for ego. They wanted to be part of it. They wanted to control it. The people around them were fighting, and they figured that's the way you show how you win. I mean, look at what happened at Jericho. Why wouldn't you want to conquer the whole land the way you conquered Jericho? How can your, how, what general gets the credit for that? Yeah, exactly. And that was the problem. The children of Israel ended up losing many of them, losing their lives and getting all mixed up with all their pagan rights in the, in the country because they didn't get rid of everybody. Because what did they want to do? They wanted to use their own swords and say, God, I didn't win by your power. I won by sticking my sword through somebody. How foolish can you be? Good thing we're not like that. Yeah. <laughs> Why do we want to do things our way when God would be willing to direct us? He'd be more than happy to direct us to do things His way. I had a thought today that I don't know if it fits or not, but we, with great pride and rationale, say, I want to be responsible. Mm -hmm. I want to do the responsible thing. And then we run off and we want to do another responsible thing. And before you know, we have filled our life with responsible things that we don't let, that we take responsibility for instead of letting him. Yeah. Let's look at some examples of faith in, in, in the word of God and, and people who responded to Jesus in various ways. You remember the story of the Roman official who came to Jesus in Cana? Mm -hmm. uh, look at Matthew 8, and let's start with verse 7. I will go, and the man asks, says, I've got this, this, well, let's start with verse 5. When Jesus entered Capernaum, a Roman officer met him and begged for help. Sir, my servant is sick in bed at home, unable to move and suffering terribly. Now, if, you, if we had time to compare the other dis dis uh, uh, Gospels, we would discover that he didn't think he was worthy to come to Jesus. So first he sent some other people. He said, please go and ask that man. I, I know he must be too busy to talk to me, and I'm, I'm not even a Jew. You know, go and ask him. And finally he went himself. He said, please. Uh, and so Jesus responds, I will go and make him well, Jesus said. Oh, 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 no, sir, answered the officer. I do not deserve to have you come into my house. Just give the order, and my servant, and long ways away, my servant will get well. I, too, am a man under the authority of superior officers, and I have soldiers under me. I order this one go, and he goes. I order that one come, and he comes. And I order my slave do this, and he does it. Now, this wasn't the days of walkie-talkies. This wasn't the days of radio or telephone or, or television. 
How did he have an idea that Jesus could exert an influence miles away? I mean, we think, of, we think of all kinds of ways that people can impact other people from, from a distance. But what did he have to base that on? He must have been observing and for a, a considerable amount of time. What was Jesus' response? When Jesus heard this, he was surprised and said to the people following, I tell you, I have never found anyone in Israel with faith like this. And of course, what did Jesus do? <coughs> he healed. He healed him. And you remember the story of Jesus coming to the pool of Bethesda, or maybe it was Bethsaida, or maybe it was Bethzatha. We don't know what the name of that pool really was. But anyway, he comes to that pool, and he's wandering there on a Sabbath, Sabbath afternoon, and here are all these sick people. And what does he come upon? He comes on a guy who has been paralyzed for 38 years. And what did Jesus say to him? Pick up your bed and walk. Yep. Take up your bed and walk. Now, was this an emergency case? 38 years? I don't think so. <laughs> you don't think so? It doesn't sound like an emergency, does it? The sick man answered a question, I don't have anybody put me in the water. And Jesus said, don't bother with that. Just get up. Pick up your mat and walk. And what did the man say? Well, Jesus, you know, I can't do that. Why do you think I'm lying here? No, he said, let me try. And he got up, and he was pretty soon leaping and jumping around. And, and what, was the, what did the Pharisees and the Sadducees say to him? Oh, violated the Sabbath. <laughs> what are you doing carrying that little roll-up mat? It's the Sabbath. Well, And that story was in John 5, by the way. Yes, John 5. But I think his answer was just great. Yeah. <laughs> the guy that healed me told me to carry it. <laughs> <laughs> another, another bit of humor from the scriptures. That God, oh, yes. you know. Well, look at Matthew 14. Here's an example that maybe isn't such a good example of faith. Jesus, remember, he had, had spoken all day, and he told his disciples to depart by boat somewhere around sundown. He had gone up to the hill to pray. And somewhere around 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, he comes walking across the water to greet them in the boat. So what has Jesus been doing all night long? Rain. We talked about that last week, didn't we? And so they see him coming, and they're scared to death. And he's, Jesus says, I, I, it's I. Don't, don't be afraid. Then Peter, Peter spoke up, Lord, if it is really you, order me to come out on the water to you. And Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and started walking on the water to Jesus. But when he noticed a strong wind, he was afraid of starting to he was afraid and started to sink down in the water. Save me, Lord, he cried. At once Jesus reached out and grabbed hold of him and said, How little faith you have. Why did you doubt? With Jesus right there. And him on the water. And him on the water. I always think of a funny story when I read this passage. Uh, many years ago, there was, a, I don't know if it's still there, a big reflecting pool out in front of Notre Dame University in Indiana. And someone put a little sign out there and says, please don't walk on the water. <laughs> 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 well, what can we learn from the examples of these three people and their faith? How, what was their, I mean, we're talking about Bible study now. What was their response to the Word of God? Flat out acceptance. Every one of them said, yes. Just, you know, tell me. What do you want me to do? I respond, so forth like that. Even, you don't have to even come. Just speak the Word, right? But then, like many of us, when things a few doubts started to rise in our mind, oh dear, and we start sinking. Which one of these three people would you say most closely represents your faith experience? You don't have to answer out loud. No, you need a fourth, <laughs> I think. <laughs> I'm more like Peter. <laughs> more like Peter, okay. Well, the Apostle Paul spent years ministering in Corinth and later in Ephesus. You know, a year and a half in Corinth and three years in Ephesus. Looked at superficially, these two cities were large and very sinful. I mean, above Corinth, 
there was that temple to Aphrodite. And who stayed up there? A thousand temple virgins <laughs> with big quotation marks around that. And they would descend every afternoon about four o'clock to do their thing in the city. And this was a seaport. So you can imagine what kind of stuff went on there. Well, we came to Ephesus. And what went on in Ephesus? There was a temple, a gargantuan, huge temple outside of Ephesus, four or five times bigger than the Parthenon in Athens. And what was that temple for? The worship of a many-breasted fertility cult goddess. And you can just guess what kind of stuff went on there. Well, if you just showed up at that pl such a place, wouldn't you, like Paul, say, man, I, I, think, I think I better move on. This, how can I get any, accomplish anything in this sinful city? But what did God tell him? Get busy. Got work to do here. There's a lot of work to do here. Stick around. Well, later, after ministering for a long time in Ephesus, Paul traveled away from Ephesus. When he returned, he told them some very interesting words. Look at Acts 20 starting with verse 27. Paul now has come back to his friends that he lived with for seven years. For I have not held back from announcing to you the whole purpose of God. So keep watch over yourselves and over all the flock which the Holy Spirit has placed in your care. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he made his own through the blood of his Son. I know that after I leave, fierce wolves will come among you and they will not spare the flock. Fierce wolves will come where? Inside the church. And he emphasizes that in the next verse. The time will come when some men from your own group will tell lies to lead the believers away after them. Watch then. Remember that with many tears day and night, I taught every one of you for three years. And now I commend you to the care of God and to the message of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the blessings God has for all his people. Question. Close. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Why were these women referred to as virgins? These women? Mm -hmm. Because it was believed that if you had intercourse with them or you had a relationship with one of these virgins, you weren't really having a relationship with them. You're having a relationship with the God that they represented. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Ellen White has given us some pretty startling and pretty serious words. Before you go to yeah. that, so this verse in Acts, this text in Acts, suggests that church leaders will mislead us. That's what it sounds like, doesn't it? That's what it sounds like. So we have to... Has that ever happened in the we, Christian church? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We have to base our relationship not on what someone tells us, even you, mm -hmm. but on what the Bible tells us. Doesn't Revelation say, as one of the final instructions, be not deceived? Mm -hmm. And Jesus said that. Be yeah. not deceived. God is not, well, Paul said, yeah. God is not marked. marked. Whatsoever a man sows, that we also reap. Yeah. But Jesus said, you know, many times in, in various forms, do, don't be deceived. Matthew 24, Luke, Mark 13, Luke 21. Yeah. There's a... And so how do we go about determining whether or not the Bible is true? Because we've suggested, okay, your faith is supposed to be based on evidence. How do we do that? I, I think some of the best evidence is given in the prophecies. Okay. And that's, how, how, that's how almost it? mathematical. You can analyze it. You can look at it from a hundred different directions. But when it all comes out, it, it, it tells things in the future. And they come true. And so if that is what God can do, Maybe the rest of what he has to say is good. If God predicts something 100 years in advance, 200 years, 500 years, 2,300 years in advance, and it happens exactly as he said. That's a good starting place. How does faith. that work? How does that work? I mean, there's no way that could happen except that God 
is way beyond our capacity. Isaiah 40, if we had time. Isaiah 40 to 55, that whole section is a section I like to call, Will the Real God Please Stand Up? And let's take just a second and look over there. Um, look at Isaiah 44, for example. Um, and uh, let's start with verse 9. All those who make idols are worthless, and the gods they prize so highly are useless. Those who worship these gods are blind and ignorant, and they will be disgraced. It's no good making a metal image to worship as a god. Everyone who worships it will be humiliated. The people who, made who make idols are human beings and nothing more. Let them come and stand trial. They will be terrified and will suffer disgrace. The metal worker takes a piece of metal and works with it over a fire. His strong arm swings a hammer and pound the metal into shape. As he works, he gets hungry, thirsty, and tired. The carpenter measures the wood. He outlines the figure with chalk, carves it out with his tools, and makes it in the form of a man a handsome human figure to be placed in his house. He might cut down cedars to use or choose oak or cypress wood from the forest, or he might plant a laurel tree and wait for the rain to make it grow. A person uses part of a tree for fuel and part of it to make an idol. With one part he builds a fire to warm himself and bake bread, and with the other part he makes a god and worships it. With some, of the wood he makes a, um, with some of the wood he makes a fire, he roasts meat, eats it, and is satisfied. He warms himself and says, how nice and warm. What a beautiful fire. The rest of the wood he makes into an idol, and then he bows down and worships it. He prays to it and says, you are my God, save me. Such people are too stupid to know what they're doing. <laughs> they, they go, they close their eyes and their minds to the truth. I mean, I mean, how can you? I mean, does this kind of evidence suggest something? What today? I mean, we don't do that today. Yeah. But we're just as bad off. In what way? Well, what do we look to for our salvation? Our 401ks, our house, our cars? No or, being, or being responsible. Or being responsible. Well, where do we draw the line? Because the Bible also tells us not to be foolish to save. Because, yeah. you know, I've, I myself, you know, I've messed up in you know, certain areas. But that's why we have to have a balance. And I don't think it's bad to save or do good things. Yeah, or no, do no. Things. no. We're tr not trying to say that. We're trying to say... Are you saving responsibly, or are you saving because you worship your 401k? Yeah. And for and people who might be listening for? from other yeah. parts of the world, 401k is a special tax-exempt uh, uh, plan that's available in the United States for people to save primarily for retirement. It's not any magic. It's just a, something the government provides. Well, let me read the last couple of sentences here. The makers of idol, my idols has in the wit of the sense to say, some of the wood I burnt up, I baked some bread on the embers, and I roasted meat and ate it. And the rest of the wood I made into an idol. Here I am bowing down to a block of wood. <laughs> well, I mean, how much better is all our wealth going to be when this world comes to an end than a block of wood? Read yes. The, read the next verse. Verse okay. 20 also. It makes as much sense as eating ashes. His foolish ideas have so misled him that he is beyond help. He won't admit to himself that the idol he holds in his hand is not a god at all. And if you go on to read to this. <laughs> the 401k you hold in your hand. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, and he goes on through this whole section and he says, he just says, I, w I can predict the future. I created this world out of nothing. Can your gods do that? So those are the two things uh, God created out of nothing, and he predicts the future far, far in advance. advance. Those are the two most important things. He also talks about the fact that he can make <coughs> things happen the way else can make up, basically miracles. He can perform miracles. Now we know that the time is coming in the future when the devil will perform miracles. And he will, he will deceive a lot of people with his miracles, okay? 
Well, and now let me read some very stern words, some very, very significant words from Ellen White. This is from Great Controversy, <clears throat> and it's page uh, 593 and going on into 594. And I want to, let's just spend a few minutes thinking about these words. To the law and to the testimony, quoting from Isaiah 820, if they speak not according to this world, word, it is because there is no light in them. The people of God are directed to the scriptures as their safeguard against the influence of false teachers and the delusive power of spirits of darkness. What does that tell us? What's going to protect us from these delusive powers? Scripture. To know what it says. Know the Bible very well. Satan employs every possible device to prevent men from obtaining a knowledge of the Bible. For its plain utterances reveal his deceptions. What kind of devices do you think of immediately that the devil uses to keep us from studying scripture? Television. Television. Music. Music. Entertainment. Yeah. What about just being too busy? Yeah. Work. Work. Overcharged with the cares of this life. Surfeited, as it says in the King James. Yeah. Huh? At every revival of God's work. Now what's happening here? People are coming alive under the influence of God, right? Mm -hmm. The prince of evil is aroused to more intense activity. We've got to be careful. Who's going to wake up if we're waking up? Satan. I guess we just need to wake up more. <laughs> <laughs> he is now putting forth his utmost efforts for a final struggle against Christ and his followers. The last great delusion is soon to open before us. Antichrist is to perform his marvelous works in our sight. Now, it doesn't specifically say who Antichrist is, but the context would suggest what? Satan. Yeah, the That's devil. devil controlled. Yeah. And Antichrist is, is the, if not the devil himself, at least he's, devil, he's controlled by the devil. So closely will the counterfeit resemble the true that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except by the Holy Scriptures. Expand on that just a little bit. Give me, what, what do you see in your mind when you say closely counterfeit? So what would it look like? Well, let's think about this. We're told that Jesus is going to come in a certain way. Certain things are going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're told that uh, and if you look at the book of Revelation, for example, the Godhead has a, a Father, a Son, and a Holy Spirit. You look in the Revelation and you find out that the devil has what? He has a dragon, a beast, a beast, and a, out and of a the false thing. prophet. Yeah. A dragon, a beast, and a false prophet. Mm -hmm. God is, uh, was, and is, and will come. Now, that's, that's literally will come as in being present. It's not just... He's not, is to come, going to be, you know, it continue to exist. The devil did what? Revelation 13 says that he suffered a terrible wound. And it looked like he was dead. And so the revelation describes the Satan as he was, he is not, looks like he's dead, but he is, he is to come. The devil is going to come and he's going to look like he's coming like Christ. And I can assure you without the slightest hesitation of being wrong that he's going, to, um, he's going to impersonate the coming of Christ as much as God will allow him. He's going to make that coming look so much. He's going to fulfill every picture that he possibly can from, from scriptures that God will allow him to. I think that's part of the reason why we're given instructions. If... If somebody says he's out in the desert, don't go. If he's in some room, don't go there because you're not going to have the, the what it takes to resist it in that environment. Mm -hmm. And I read from Matthew 24 to take a little side trip here. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear. They will perform great miracles and wonders in order to deceive even God's chosen people if, if, if possible. We have a, a listener okay. 
who has a comment on the three things to yeah. do. A look at history, a look at prophecy, and a look at its effect on those who read and are moved by it. Okay. Very good. Very appropriate. Very appropriate. Okay. Let me read that last sent couple sentences again. So closely will the counterfeit resemble the true that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except by the Holy Scriptures. If Satan appears in your face and says, I am Jesus Christ, I've come back to save you, what are you going to say? Hmm. Not so. My Bible says something different. By their testimony, each statement and every miracle must be tested. Those who endeavor to obey all the commands of God will be opposed and derided. They can stand only in God. In order to endure the trial before them, they must understand the will of God as revealed in His Word. They can honor Him only as they have a right conception of His character, government, and purposes, and act in accordance with them. None but those who have fortified the mind with the truths of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. Great Conference, 593 and 594. None but those who have fortified the mind. What does it mean to fortify the mind? Stockpile. Be prepared. I had the privilege recently of going on a field trip with my grandson who's in the eighth grade, and we visited some forts. And the walls of those forts are thick. And these were ones from Revolutionary War times and so forth. I mean, these were dirt walls, you know, many feet thick, 12, 15 feet thick. Do you think that would prepare, protect you against a Revolutionary War cannon? 12 feet of dirt. Mm -hmm. Very good protection. Do we know the Bible so well that not even the devil himself in person will be able to confuse us about its teachings? Our only safety is in making the Bible our daily study. When discussing faith and works, one scholar simply said, faith works. What does that mean? Faith is an action word. Yeah. Faith is an action word. As we study the Bible, as we get to know God better, it will change us. It transforms us. It's not something we do. It's, it means when you open your eyes and you focus on Scripture, and you, if you're serious about your reading and studying of the Scriptures, the Holy Spirit is working right inside here and transforming your life. Have you ever read the, the stories, the prophecies, and even the history of the Bible with the specific intent of asking what you can learn about God from every passage or story? Men and women of prayer, their minds saturated with the Word of God, have changed the world as the Holy Spirit changed them through the Word. One such earth shaker was Martin Luther. Luther, however, had difficulty believing that God actually loved him. His picture of God was one of a vindictive judge and a wrathful tyrant. One day, while examining some books in the library at the University of Erfurt, where he was a monk, Notice, this guy had already had a lot of training. Luther discovered a Latin Bible. This was the first time he had ever held a copy of the entire Bible in his hands. Ellen G. White describes his reaction this way. With mingled awe and wonder, he, Luther, turned the sacred pages. With quickened pulse and throbbing heart, he read for himself the words of life, pausing now and then to exclaim, Oh, that God would give me such a book for myself. Angels of heaven were by his side, and rays of light from the throne of God revealed the treasures of truth to his understanding. Great Controversy, page 122. Oh. So how do we respond when we hold a Bible in our hands? The devil is doing everything possible to keep us so busy that we don't have time to open our Bibles, let alone really study them. How are we going to overcome that problem? Just as the written Word of God, I'm sorry, just as the Bible is the written Word of God, Jesus is the living example of the Word in human flesh. By looking to and studying the life of Christ, we can be transformed, and I read, the creative energy that calls the, called the worlds into existence is in the Word of God. This Word imparts power. It begets life. 
Every command is a promise. What, what, what does that mean? Every command is a promise? Have you thought about it? Every command is a promise. That means if God says, I want you to go and do this and this and this, it's he will give you power to do what? It's a promise you can accomplish it. It's something that you can accomplish. When God told Jesus, okay, and they worked out, out in, in nights of prayer, and he said to Jesus, okay, I want you to go, and this is what I want you to do today, did Jesus have any doubt about whether it would, it would be possible to accomplish that? How often do we doubt God's word? Do we ever think, no, God, I, 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 I'm sure I can't accomplish, I can't do that. I can't speak to my neighbors about you. I can't go out and spread the gospel. I can't, I can't, I can't. Sounds like Moses. <laughs> Accepted by the will, received, in other words, we, we, we agree with it, Received into the soul, we believe it, it brings with it the life of the infinite one. Let's read that again. Every command is a promise, accepted by the will. So we're reading, we're taking in God's ideas. We're accepting, we say, yeah, I, I, I accept that, I believe it. It brings with it what? Life to the end. The life of the infinite one. Who's the infinite one? God. God himself will come into our lives if we just open the door and allow him. It transforms the nature and recreates the soul in the image of God. We've been talking about Bible study. This is the breath of the soul. This is the food from heaven. This is the thing that God says, he would perform all kinds of miracles to make. In fact, look at all the miracles he performed just to make it available to us. And there's never been a group of people, a generation that had so much available to them from God as we have today. All the different translations, we can read it in the original languages if we've been trained to do so. We've got so many translations in so many languages. I mean, what else could we ask for? And we have all the writings of Ellen White. And what are we doing? Our Laodicean message says we are sleeping. Yeah. I think it's time, friends, for us to wake up. Revival, come back to life, and that's my challenge to you for this week.